Well, good morning, Christ Church. Good to be here today with you. Uh, super excited to be able to uh, serve you uh, by opening up God's Word today. If you're here for the first time, my name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I want to invite you to take your Bibles, if you have them, and uh, turn to Ephesians. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians this morning, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be examining uh, verses 11 through 16. I'm just going to meet you there in a minute. Uh, but for our visiting friends, we have a commitment here, and the commitment of the ministry here at Christ Church is to systematically uh, teach the Word of God. We're very serious about God's Word. We believe that this book is life-changing. These words are alive, and so we systematically teach the Bible. We believe that the overflow of that is highly productive uh, for growth and nourishment for God's people. So Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 11 uh, through 16 this morning. And as you're turning there, if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the seat in front of you. You go ahead and grab that, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We have a little bumper series before we get back into John, and it's called Growing Together, and really appreciate whoever made that little bumper video. Uh, that really kind of spells it out. Why are we doing this? Why are we reaching back into the 90s and actually giving a theme for the year for our church? Like, does that even ever happen today, right? But we felt like, we felt like this is where God was leading us as pastors. We were praying and talking, we were concerned. One of the concerns is that we look really healthy on the surface, right? Look like a healthy church. Like we look really healthy on the surface, but below the surface, we're weak. Last week I gave uh, an illustration of a tree, right? A trees in Arizona, they just have a tendency whenever it sprinkles, they tap out. Like they just like fall over. It's just crazy, right? I'm from the Midwest. Trees don't just fall over. Have a little rain, a little wind. They're like, I'm out. And, and, and you know the reason for that, right? They look really strong on, on the surface, but below they have no root system. There's no widening of the roots. There's no deepening of the roots. And I'm just concerned that on the outset, we look like a functioning, healthy church. But activity doesn't necessarily mean growth. Activity, we have programs, we have ministries, we're here together, we're consistent, we have small groups and studies, and we heard about them. All these things are starting up again in this ministry year, but activity doesn't necessarily mean growth. And so we want to go to the Bible, because if you Google growth, what, 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 what will you get in terms of church? How to bring people into your doors. How to bring numbers with ticks, tricks, and, and, and techniques into your door. But we want to go to God's Word for a deeper, wider understanding of what it means to grow Together, and uh, we're going to continue our theme with a message entitled today, Together. Together. Last week was growing. This week is together. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. Now, come on. We, we, we understand this together, right? We have a culture of isolation. More and more today, it's just like people are arm's length. They are distancing themselves from community. They are isolated. I read this week that architects uh, in these last several years are designing homes to be intentionally private and secret, and they're promoting seclusion, not connection. I mean, we live in Arizona. I have never seen prison block until I moved to Arizona. Who, who puts prison block in their backyard? 16 years ago, I show up and I'm like, are you serious? I feel like I'm in prison right now. Everywhere you go, you buy a house, you have prison block. And, and nobody opens their garage. I mean, everybody's like, they shut it as soon as they get into the garage. There is no, there is isolation. There is lack of connection. That was not always the case. Remember the front porch? The front porch, the wraparounds. I mean, listen, there was no such thing as a commute. Like, what was a commute? Commutes were non-existent. We had front porch. The front porch were like a barrier, right? It was the zone between public and private. Um, you, could, you, you would sit on your front porch and you would look at strangers walking by and actually have a conversation with them. They were allowed to come on your front porch. Random people. It's like, hey, more the merrier. Here's a glass of lemonade. Like th that was the ideal of community in America. Now we have block walls. And I am concerned that the American church has kind of bought into that culture of 
isolation, uh, holding people at arm's length, just letting them in your lives just a little bit, but not so much. And after almost 25 years of ministry, I can't believe it, I was counting it this week. I was like, I almost been in ministry, full-time ministry for 25 years. I could tell you that people change, people who change, people who develop real life patterns for growth, who become more and more and more mature as followers of Christ, I'm telling you, it doesn't happen with you building up a silo around your life. It doesn't happen in a silo. It doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in community. Now, some of you are like, well, I got, you know, listen, I just need my Bible open and my eyes upward. I got this me and Jesus thing figured out. That is not the full picture of growth. And where we are at this morning, what we're learning this morning from Ephesians 4 is that we cannot flourish spiritually without each other. It's part of the design for growth. God wants us to embrace the people that he's put around and in our lives as a resource for change. So Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 11 through 16. We're going to do what we always do. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to take a few minutes, and we're going to unpack its truth together. Paul says in verse 11, follow along with me if you have your bottles. Paul says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that, that's really important right there, that's a hinge, that's the purpose statement, here it is, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That is the passage we're studying today together. I want to give you this big idea. I want to give you this big idea over the passage. But first, I want to tell you, we're going into a deep well, okay? For all you scholars out here who are going to critique the way I preach and what I mention and don't mention, we are diving into, listen, we are going to pull one bucket of fresh water out of a deep well. We can, I'm, I'm telling you, there's a thousand more where that came from. We can go down in this well. I could preach for the next 10 weeks on this passage, and we would never run out of water for our souls. I'm going to take one bucket this morning, and I'm going to reach in. It's kind of like looking at a diamond, and we're going to study one facet of the diamond, and we're going to learn together. The big idea this morning that we see from the text is this. Growing together requires active commitment to uniform convictions. You know what I'm talking about? Active conviction to like constant convictions, unchanging, unalterable convictions. That is how we grow together. Active commitment to these uh, specific biblical truths. And the together part depends on that. I mean, you can grow in some ways on your own, can't you? You can grow in some ways with active commitment to other biblical truths, but the specific biblical convictions that make it together is that we are, and, and this is what we're going to see in the text, we're the participant. Stability is the goal. Cooper cooperation is, is the plan of God in order to see growth in our lives, in the life of this church. But, but I'll tell you first and foremost, that's not a given, isn't it? It's not a given. It's not a given. In fact, it's tragically uncommon to see a lack of growth in the life of the church. But in every church, and, and, and by God's grace, we're, we're this church. But in every church where the gospel is preached and the word of God is honored, there is growth. And we're going to see this today growing together. This is the vision of Paul for the church of Ephesus that requires this active commitment to these specific truths, you're like, okay, what are they? 
We're going to look at three of them. I just mentioned them. We're going to look at the participants, the stability, and the cooperation. So the participants were it. The stability, that's the purpose. And the cooperation of our lives together is the plan. So let's look at those three. Here's the first one. Number one, growing together requires that, conviction number one, we are the participants. You and I. Like there's nobody, there's no bleachers. Wouldn't that be weird to go to a football game with no bleachers, right? There's no bleachers. There's no bleachers. Every single one of us are the participants. You fit in one of two categories. You're either the supply line or you're the front line, okay? But you're, you're one of those. You're a participant. You're either the sideline. I mean, I'm sorry, there's no sidelines. You're either, sorry, the supply line or you're the front line. Those are the two groups of participants. Let's look at the leaders. The leaders are the supply line. Paul says in verse 11, he says, and, that's a conjunction, and that's pointing back to verses 7 and 8 where he says, where he says, he has given us gifts. Well, what gifts has he given us? He's given us leaders. He's given us gifts. Look at, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Now, depending on how you look at that, there are four to five categories of leadership. You have the apostles. Who are the apostles? And chosen by God, right? Chosen by God to be the foundation stones of the church and, and as such ceased to exist when the original apostles died. Somebody's like, there's no apostles today? There's no apostles today. It's like, how can you not believe in apostolic leadership? If we don't have apostolic leadership, this is what some people say, uh, we're vulnerable to corruption. No, 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 listen, listen, listen. I believe in apostolic leadership. We've got some serious apostolic leadership. We've got Paul. We've got this guy named Peter. And we got John. We got Thomas, Matthew, Bartholomew, and all the other dudes who died, right? who God used as a foundation stone for the church, but they all have died. But we're hearing their words because most of them, right, had a, had a part in writing God's words down. That is the apostles. There's no apostles today. The apostles were the disciples of Jesus in the early church that God used as an instrument to grow and build his church. Alongside it, look at what we have. We have prophets. Now, prophets, this is big P prophet, okay? This is linked with the apostles, and among other things, what did prophets do? They wrote down the words of God. They wrote down the Bible, and since the Bible is complete, guess what? In that sense, there are no big P prophets today. So we have two offices or categories that has, they've, they've ce they're ceased to exist. They, they've they're gone, right? They're here. We have the words of that ministry, of their ministry right here. But then there's a couple others. Look, at we have the evangelists. And we just call those guys church planners, right? Like they just, they're the guys who develop new churches. And then we have preacher and teacher. A lot of scholars would say those are two different categories. I really believe that Paul links both terms together. So he has both nouns describe one office, both nouns, describe one person. We might say it like pastor, teacher. You've got the apostles, you've got the prophets, you've got the evangelists. These are the leaders of the church. And you've got the pastor, teacher. That's the supply line. That's the gifts that we have been given. Why are these gifts given to us? Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12, to equip the saints. Do you see that? That word equip means to mature the saints, to uh, complete, right? Bring to completion. It's a maturity word. Listen, the church has an equipping ministry. That is taking the teaching of God's word. That is taking the teaching and putting it together in such a way that it gives a person a track to run on, right? That, that, that they can move from uh, undeveloped to underdeveloped to, to developed they can move from minimally useful to maximally useful. Well, here's why. We have the supply line, teaching, training, teaching, training. The front line, who are the members? Look at 
for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. We have the leaders of the church, the pastor teachers of the church, who are equipping the saints, that's you and me, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. We have leaders that are the supply line. We have members, that's you and I, who are the front line. This is just like every, every member of gospel ministry. That's what it is. It's a collective endeavor. Remember 1 Corinthians 12, right? We all have gifts. We're all members of one body. And if we don't, if, if that's lacking, that's hard, that's, that's, that, that's harsh on the body. Each person plays a, plays a role in advancing God's people to the maturity of his son. A lot of times, uh, we don't do this as much anymore, but when the kids were growing up, Lori would set up a table <clears throat> in the living room, and they do it randomly. I always just, part- I just observe because I'm impatient. But they take those thousand-piece puzzles, and they put them together. It's like, are you kidding me? I, I, I try a couple, and I'm like, I'm out of here. Oh, this is not working. But they, they do that, and they're really good at that, especially my wife and my daughter, Macy. And there are the couple times where they would try to do that, and they get to the end of the puzzle, and you know what I'm going to say. Where's the last piece? I mean, that defeats the whole progress, doesn't it? It's like I just worked on this thing for a week, and I can't find the last piece. Probably our dog Bodhi ate it. That's probably what happened. Like, translate that to the body of Christ, right? We're all members. We're all participants. Every part is essential. You're either the supply line or you're the front line. But with every individual piece, guess what? We're stronger. And that's the real ministry that Paul is talking about. Let me get super practical with you. It's like two moms. We have moms in here. Raise your hand. Like, it's like two moms. Instead of competition and comparison... They're, they're going to love each other. They're going to help each other. They're going to they're gonna pour into each other. They're going to live in humility with each other, alongside each other. It's, it's the young boy refusing to join in with his friends in unwholesome words that, for a cheap laugh. Instead, they're going to use words that build up. It's that nine-to-fiver every single week, 40 hours a week, just plugging in numbers into a spreadsheet as an act of devotion. This is every member ministry. It's the husband just laboring and toiling and working hard to love his wife in such a way that she grows up into Christ, even as he overlooks her unfair criticism of him. It's the, it's the wife choosing to honor her husband when he doesn't deserve it and where there's a temptation and an opportunity to speak disrespectfully about him. It's... Uh, it looks like inviting people actually over to your house for dinner instead of like Pita Jungle or, or Grimaldi's. It's like you actually are going to come over to my house and we're going to hang out and you're going to live in my place and we're going to fellowship together and it's reaching out to a neighbor. It's sending an email to a discouraged brother. This is the real ministry that Paul is talking about. And, and none of these, of course, look glamorous. But this is the way we minister. This is the way we participate. I'm either the supply line or I'm the front line. And our ability together to minister like this is rooted in our identity. Back up to verse 7 and 8. And our identity is given to us by grace. We're participants by grace. We embrace our identity by grace. If you see a need, you fill it in the grace of Jesus Christ. This is the conviction. We're talking about uniform convictions that <clears throat> result in growth together. Here's the second one. Growing together requires that stability is the purpose. So there's a goal. There's an aim. Like, who wants to do something if there's not an aim, if there's not an objective? Have you ever watched a movie where it's like you get to the end of the movie and it's like, what in the world? What was the goal? Like, what was it? There wasn't even any plot. It's like a waste of two hours. Can I get that two hours back, right? There's a goal in our growing together, in its stability. Paul says in verse 13, until we all attain the unity of the faith. These are the infinitives, right? Unity of the faith. The knowledge of the Son, you see that? Mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All those 
help us get to a place of stability. Look at verse 14. So that, this is the purpose statement, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So that, in other words, right, so that when the waves hit, we won't get washed out to sea, so that when the wind blows of doctrines, we won't be carried along by those doctrines and the schemes and the tactics of the enemy. That's not what's going to happen. Instead, I'm going to choose to stay on course in the gospel till I see my Savior face to face and maturity comes to its fullness. So how is that going to be produced? How is that stability going to be uh, produced? How is that standing firm in the faith going to be cultivated? Here's how. There's those three things I mentioned right before before verse 14. One is unity. You see it? We attain to the unity of the faith. God wants a mature, working, serving, unified church. How many churches are just known for fractions and strife and division? Like, I grew up in a really small church in rural, like rural church. And, I mean, they would have church splits for the craziest Like when PowerPoint came out, remember that? It's like half the church is like, no, we're giving in to Satan, you know, and then they just went and planted another church. It's like, are you kidding me? This is the world. The world is known for division. The world is known for strife and envy. God wants a mature, unified church. Every member being built up, there's a growing oneness, heartbreaking Uh, when there isn't a maturing process that allows the church to become stable but is instead fractured and disconnected. I mean, what a tragic witness to the world. What a tragedy. You've got unity, but also you've got, look at what it says, growing in the knowledge of what? Of who? The Son of God. You have knowledge. Like, this is knowledge. This is like, this is not basic knowledge, okay? This is this is experiential. This is, a, this is deep-rooted, personal, experiential, like Christ is settled into your life. He's making, you know, he's making his home. He's moving the furniture around in your heart, and he's making your soul his home. It says to mature manhood. That's, that's the point. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I mean, what, he, what is he saying? He's saying, listen, he's moving into our lives so we would become just like him. Maturity. I love 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, as we gaze at his glory, whose glory? Christ's glory. As we gaze at the glory of Christ, we're changed into his image. The deeper our knowledge of Christ, the more more we comprehend who he is, the more we're transformed into his very image. Image. Now, those descriptors or infinitives in verse 13, that's what it means to be a person of stability. And the question is, is are these things actually working themselves out in your life? Can you actually say, I'm a person of stability in my faith? I'm not crumbling every time there's a circumstance. Can you actually say, like, I'm growing up in my faith, in unity, in knowledge, in maturity, so that we may know, look at what it says, so that we may no longer be children. Now, there's a bunch of implications here. I want to give you two. You see that in verse 14, so that we no longer may be children, which means that once we were, it's basic knowledge, folks. Like, that's how it starts, right? <laughs> we're born We're born as an infant, as a child, but we grow up into adulthood, and the same is spiritually. Now, you think about an infant, you think about a child, I mean, children are are fickle, aren't they? I mean, if you're you're single, have you ever seen this? Like, you're in the middle of a grocery store, and I mean, the kid is just sideways. He's wailing and screaming and crying, and the mom gets on his level, and she's like, you want some ice cream? He's like, all right. Wait a second, you just went from, like, I'm dying to everything's great? Like, how fickle can that be, right? 
That's, we see that. We see that all the time. Uh, children are deceivable. I mean, they have very open minds, parents. Children are deceivable. Spiritual babies are the same way. I mean, you get all hyped up. You read a book. You listen to a message. You're like, man, I'm going to change. And then like, you walk out that door and you forget everything. You're like, God answered my prayer. He loves me. And three days later, God didn't answer my prayer. I don't think he loves me. We're so fickle. We're so deceived. We just zip around like that as infants, right? We just zip around like that as spiritual infants. Not a lot of stability. That's how it starts. Here's another one. We're impatient. Um, infants are very, they don't understand patience. Like, they, they don't, they, there's no concept of delayed gratification. They want muscles like right now. Like, in a spiritual sense, they want some gym candy, right? I mean, they want muscles like yesterday. That's steroids, everybody. That's just the term for steroids. <laughs> Babies want steroids. I mean, what does Paul say in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He's like, man, remove this. I need to be delivered from this thorn right now. Like, take this thorn away for like three seasons. He's like, I need it gone now. And Jesus is like, nope. Nope. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in patience. I mean, if you go to the gym, like, so I lift. Uh, I try to stay in shape. I know it doesn't look like it, but it could look a lot worse, I'm telling you. And, uh, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I hurt my back right at the beginning of the summer. I took the summer off. I, I just started lifting again this week. And um, notice I didn't say cardio. I just started lifting again this week, and um, are, it's just so discouraging, right? You get back, and it's like you usually feel weaker before you feel stronger. That's just the way it goes. You, feel, you always feel like you're getting weaker, but really, little by little, you're getting stronger. But it's just going to take a long time. It's just going to take a while. It's going to be a process. Babies don't like that. They're not into the long game. And spiritually speaking, babies aren't into the long game. You start out that way, but listen, listen, you start out as a child, but you don't stay a child. You grow up. It takes time. Listen to me. It's a process, isn't it? Little by little, we get a little less fickle. We get just a little less deceived. We get a, we're a little less impatient. Our, lot, our mind is growing into the long game. We're growing up until we attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of, of the Son to mature. Listen, not only learning the Bible's doctrine, not only convicted by the Bible's teaching, but, but I'm actually like making changes in, in my life. I'm letting God's word discipline me, and I'm letting God's word change the way I live today and tomorrow and the way in which I like deal and relate with people and the way I regard myself. It's changing me. The way I behave on the job and so on and so on and so on. Paul says, look at yourself. Look at the fruit. Do you have the fruit of stability in your life? Are you going from a child to an adult spiritually? If you're a child still and you've been following the Lord for like 15 years, it's time, to get on the, it's time to get on the game. It's time to get into it. It's time to change. You weren't meant to be a child all your life, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine. Growth together as God intended demands active commitment to his plan, which inv involves our participation it involves stability, and it involves cooperation. Here's the final thing. Growing together requires that cooperation is the plan. It's the plan. Yeah, you know, I don't really think. I'm not the one who's going to do it. I mean, what part would I play? Listen, you have to play a part. You have to play a part. Even if you're a brand-new Christian, the, the Spirit has gifted you the, the Spirit is working in your life as you work properly. Leaders are equipping you. But cooperation is the plan that we all grab onto. 
But God's plan for growth is the church. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Like there's something supernatural about that. There's something ongoing about that. There's something unstoppable about that. But how is he building the church? 2,000 years later, how is he building his church? You and I. You and I. He's using his church to build his church. This is verses 15 and 16. It's laid out so quickly. The church is how the church grows. So the question is, is are you going to cooperate as the church? Now, there's three ways we cooperate. Number one is our words. Cooperation, look at verse 15. Cooperation involves, look at what it says, speaking the truth in love. Now, remember, I'm just grabbing a bucket, okay? There's a thousand more buckets I can grab. There's a deep well, but I'm just grabbing a bucket. And so I could, we could spend a long time on this, but I, I don't have time. We don't have the time to spend. But speaking the truth in love is so important. Speaking the truth in love means absolute honesty, but an honesty that is kind and humble and saturated with grace and mercy in love. And, and, and guess what? We need that more than we need anything else. We need to be that in a person's life, and we need a person to be that in our lives, this mixture, this perfect balance of truth and love together, because on their own, they're deadly. Okay? Love without truth, man, that is, that is a train wreck. Well, I love people, but I don't want to tell them the truth because I don't want to hurt them. Bad plan. Bad plan. Hey, listen. We all have blind spots, right? I mean, you guys have blind spots. I see them every week when I'm up here. I'm kidding. That was a joke. You can laugh at me. I have blind spots, but I can't see. You can't see your blind spots. I can't see my blind spots. I've, I've, I've told this illustration so many times, but it works so well. I mean... The reason why when you see yourself or hear yourself on a recording that it makes you want to gag um, is because actually you don't really hear yourself. I don't know if you've ever heard yourself on a recording. It's like, who is that? And all your friends are like, uh, dude, it's you. That's you. No, seriously, that's you. I'm speaking to you right now, and I, I sound pretty mellow fluent. I mean, I... I sound pretty good. How come when I press play on YouTube, I shut it off in embarrassment and I curl up in a fetal position? I'll tell you why. It's because I don't hear myself like you hear me. I actually don't hear myself through my ears. I hear myself through two bones in my head, which makes my voice sound richer and more fluent. And you hear the real thing. You're like, how does that translate? If you live in a place where people love you and will not tell you the truth about yourself, you will have no self-knowledge. You will not see what they see. You will not grow. You need accountability in your life. You need people to love you enough to tell you the truth, but not just tell you the truth, right? Love without truth is deadly, but truth without love is just as deadly. When you tell people the truth, but you're harsh and mean, and you're like a cold fish, you think people are going to hear you? Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13? He's like, you can have the tongues of angels. It's like, that would be, hey, I have a job where I speak for a living. I would love that. You, you can have the tongue of an angel, but without love, you're just noise. You're just a banging gong. Who wants, who likes banging gongs? How annoying is that, right? But that's what you are without love. You can, you can, you can tell the truth till the cows come home, my grandpa used to say, but you're just noise if it's without love. We need to be plunged into a community filled with speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. Here's another one. Our cooperation not only involves that, but it involves our Christ-centeredness. He says, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Do you see it? That's Christ-centeredness. I mean, this is a process. Have you ever seen a 13-year-old boy? 
He's like 5'5", five, five, and his feet are like 15. I mean, it's like, he, here's this little kid. He looks normal, and then you look down at his feet, and they're like boats. They're like, he's got like size 20. And what do we say? He's a biggin. Just got to grow into his puppy claws, right? He's a biggin. He's just got to grow into his feet. We, listen, as Christians, we're like that. We're like the five, five you know, like, like, listen, here, honestly, we have far bigger feet than that, okay? If you could imagine seeing somebody walk around in size 32 shoes and them being about three and a half feet tall, that's what we look like to God. We have huge feet. We have been born again. We've been adopted, the Bible says. We have the spirit of God who brought us into the family of God. We have the spirit of power. We have the spirit of wisdom and understanding and might. And all of that is in you. All of that, all that potential, all that potential, all of that is for you. You're just supposed to grow up in it. You're supposed to grow into your feet. Listen, we need your growth. We need your Christ-centeredness. We need your truth and love. We need it desperately, we're not as good without it. We've got to cooperate. And then finally, just our engagement. We have our speaking to the truth and love, our words, our Christ-centeredness, and then just our engagement from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Look at what it says, makes the body grow. The body makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What is he saying? He's saying basically spiritual growth is basically uh, parallel to organic growth. We have input, we have output. We eat, but we exercise, right? There are people who say, well, you know, I just want some input. I just need to be built up. I just need somebody to come up and minister to me and, and, and give some input to me. Well, listen, there's some seasons of input for sure, but overall, the way in which someone grows spiritually is through input an output, a person who is just coming to church and sitting and soaking and not doing and not helping and not ministering and not working and not putting out but just taking in, is somebody who says like, hey, listen, I want to be great physical shape, but I don't want to exercise. Can't be done. There's got to be a balance between the input and the output. There's got to be a balance between the exercise, which is the burning of calories, and the taking on of calories. If you burn them and not take anything in, that's called burnout. But if you're taking them in and you're not burning anything up, that's just called bloated. And that's not balanced either. There's got to be engagement. There's got to be input. There's got to be output. There's got to be cooperation. That's how the body grows through. That's God's plan, <laughs> brick by brick, through our cooperation. Listen, Christ is at the center, of course. The Spirit is empowering it, of course. But it is the church that is at. Listen, without the church working properly together, there is no growth. So you have the participants You've got the supply line and the front line, the leaders and the people. You have the purpose. The purpose is for, the goal is for, the aim, the objective is stability through maturity in doctrine and in life so that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You have the plan, everyone, every one of us cooperating together for God's plan for growth. Now, let's live this out, okay? We just learned a bunch of stuff. But let's live it out. I got three exhortations and we're done. Number one, join in, okay? Join in. Join in, for some of you, means believe the gospel. You've been, you've been, you've been living your own life. You have been earning or trying to earn favor with God. The Bible says that you cannot earn favor with God. You cannot live up to God's standard. The Bible says that Jesus came down and he lived the life we can never live and did not live. And he died the death we deserve to die. And he rose from the dead and our enemies and our sin. And whoever is willing to surrender to him as Lord and King receives eternal life. Join in. That's good news, amen? Believe the gospel, join in. Some of you are like, um, some of you is just join in. 
be a part of this family. You're like, I'm a part of this family. Are you? You come once in a while. You'll join a study here or there. You'll serve if somebody twists your arm hard enough, but you're not connected. You're not really joined in. You come once or twice a month. You've got this whole Jesus and me thing figured out. You're, this is not a rebuke, by the way. <laughs> this is an encouragement, okay? You've got the whole arm link thing going on. Don't do that. Connect to the family. Connect to the church. Let's grow together. Secondly, step up. Join in, step up. Like this is, this is from non-participation to participation for some of you. Some of you, it's from participation to more participation. Others of you, it's like more participation. And you need to take the next step, which is leadership. Step up. Action is required. Step up. And finally, reach out. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not down on marketing plans. I'm fine with branding. It's fine. Whatever. At the end of the day, I don't care. What I do care about is transformation. And what I do know is there's such thing as a culture of invitation. And it's not handing out a card. We do that sometimes. I love our communication team, by the way. Don't put this sermon on YouTube. Just put the first service on. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love all that. But you know how, you know how invitation is going to really happen? Through your transformation. Do you know that? That's the culture of invitation. God is the ultimate inviter. God invites transformation. Transformation produces naturally invitation. People see your life and they're like, I got to have me some of that. I mean, who doesn't want to be a part of a church where God is present? Paul says, if all prophesy, which means, which means if all preach the word, you stop just being weird, speaking in different languages, and you just start opening the Bible and preaching it. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, if all prophesy, preach the word, and an outsider enters, he's going to be convicted by all. The secrets of his heart will be revealed. And so, falling on his face, he will worship God. When people see transformation in your life, they will respond in worship, and they will declare that God is among you. Reach out. Reach out through transformation. Growing together requires an active commitment. Let's not forget it. We can't IV this thing here. We've got to work hard. It's an active commitment to uniform, unchanging convictions.